You are listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and a bonus episode of Navigating the French, please join us on Patreon. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we take a look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today, I'm speaking with Camille Drodz, a product designer and ceramicist in La Ciotat in the south of France. She's here to discuss a word closely linked to that oh-so-French passion for food, but rather than what's in the dishes, we're talking about the dishes themselves. Au de la table. Attention! Hey everyone, future Emily here to let you know that unfortunately we had some exceptional sound issues at the very beginning of this episode, but stay tuned, it clears up in just a second, and I promise you won't want to miss the rest of this conversation on Au de la Table. I am so excited to welcome Camille to the podcast today. Camille is an artist, an artisan, a business owner, a product designer, a ceramicist, and also happens to be one of my closest friends. And I'm really, really excited to have her joining us on the podcast today, not only because she, unlike me, has been French for her whole life. So I think she's really a good person to be um, cluing us into some elements of French culture, but also because she has some really incredible insight into the phrase that we're going to be talking about today, which I think is something that we as Americans have this idea. uh, You know, we love to think about the French as having been born with perfect aesthetic and a perfect idea of what constitutes a great meal. And there is no phrase that shows those two things combined quite so well as art de la table. So quite literally art of the table. But before we get into that, I want to welcome Kemi. Kemi, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Hi, Emily. Thanks to invite me. And thank you so much for agreeing to do this in English. You have spent quite a bit of time uh, around the world, you know, in both English and French, working with all sorts of international artists. But I'm really excited to have you talk a bit about French culture today and about Au de la Table. First off, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do for a living here in France. As you say, I'm project designer, so I'm drawing furniture and products for brands. And uh, for a few years, I have taken this particular way of drawing objects to and make them myself in my ceramic studio. This place is called Ici L'Atelier. And my partner and me imagine this firm on the human scale, uh, where everything works on circular logic to propose sustainable objects in ceramic. Yeah. And I mean, I've been to the studio a few times. First off, it's... Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's as you said, it's on a human scale. It's a, a small business right in the heart of this beautiful little Mediterranean seaside town called La Ciota. Yes. And I really love your approach, I mean, of sustainability, but also utility. So not just things that are beautiful, but things that are useful. And you and I have spent a lot of time talking about the inspiration behind a lot of your objects and not just, you know, what are they going to look like, but are they going to be aesthetically pleasing to use? So, and I love also, I remember we've known each other for a very long time. And I remember back when you were a student and you were working with upcycling materials. Like I remember you did a whole series. Oh, yes. (laughs) See, I remember. You remember that. Okay. Yeah. With coffee grounds, right? Like leftover coffee grounds. Yes, it was really interesting to work on it. I work on the waste ones can I use in different objects. So I'm working on material like échantillon. Like series. Yes. <laughs> to find a nice aesthetic aspect with waste inside porcelain. So it was like research. Perfect. So I think you have a really interesting and quite a contemporary approach to something that has a really deep rooted history in France, because you think a lot about sustainability, you think a lot about these sort of international inspirations in creating your objects. And that's something that you and I have 
talked a lot about and actually think a lot about specifically with one of our latest collaborations, which is a retreat for women in La Ciotat called Terre Mer. So do you want to talk a little bit about what inspired you to come together and create this project? I think this is how mating who inspired me. Like we met in an experience for kids in the south of France. And uh, we always want to create not a similar experience, but something procure the same memories. So we want to have something with meetings, meetings, nice people. Yeah, encounters, meetings. Yeah. Because the project that we met on was like a full immersion. Yes. But for kids. But there was that like sense of like encounter and just like meeting cool people from all over the world. And that I think, yeah, it was definitely something that inspired me as well. And um, the particularity of how relationship is like passionate people of something. And we have this particular connection because you love food and you love the history of food. And I love too. I love my work objects and we want to share this passion, like one immersive week <laughs> where you can share what you like. And we imagine this experience this week where you can do ceramic and know about South of France terroir and the connection between these two big fold. Yeah, absolutely. No, 100%. I'm very serious. <laughs> You're very serious. I think terroir is something we've talked about before on the podcast. Longtime listeners will remember the episode about terroir. And it's this, you know, this here-ness, this mm -hmm. sense of place, and this sense of connection to where you are, be it through food or wine, or, you know, in the case of Terre Mer, also just sort of the, I love one of the collections that you have at Ici L'Atelier is named after the Calanque, which are sort of these cliffs that, you know, La Ciotat is very close to Marseille, and Marseille is very famous for its Calanque, so La Ciotat also has gorgeous Calanque, and I love the way that you kind of take advantage of your surroundings to be inspired to create your objects. And I think it's um, like terroir discovery, but it's cultural heritage, like contemporary way of heritage. Yeah, and heritage, that's another word that we should talk about on the podcast for sure. Heritage, but also kind of inheritance. Like, you know, it's both. It's an interesting word that we have multiple ways of thinking about it in English. But I think that the French word is really, it encompasses a lot of different things. So we'll definitely circle back on a lot of these elements of sort of French culture and, and French terroir and terre mer, of course. But when it comes specifically to art de la table, first of all, when we talk about art de la table, are we talking about plates, forks, flowers, tablecloths, in your mind, what is that category of Al de la Table? What does it include and what does it not include? I think it's hard to define because it's very personal, I think. I think it's more a concept, like the big show of tell your guest, look what I prepare for you. Like it could be the table, it could be the decoration. It could be two tables, the one for the aperitif and the one for the meal. I think it's more like hospitality, you know, like what I prepare for you. So it could be many things and it could be many simple things, but just like a little clin d'oeil. How do you say that? A little wink. Yes. So when you were little, when you were growing up, and you were eating meals either at home or at your grandmother's house, do you remember there being a particular attention to Al de la Table? Did your grandmother have, you know, dishes that she was really proud to serve in? Or, you know, did you have special dishes that you took out only on Sundays? 
Oh, uh, yes. How important was that? But that's too much for one podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> I will try to pick some example. But yes, I can just put in example the dishes of my parents just to have a comparison. Mm -hmm. um, I have like the traditional Aikihe sets. You know the one when you, it is your first installation for couple. Yeah. Very basic, very practical. And um, not too much stuff on the table, but always something functional, like little funny, like something to grab the cheese, but something aesthetic, like something you can put it in the table. And after you have the Sunday in grandma house, and it's like the big table with many, many stuff on it, every dishes for every action something for the condiment for the salt something to decant the wine something to cut the bread something for the entree yeah the first course yes yeah, something for the second something for the cheese something for the dessert something from pretties with the coffee time uh, you have decoration too like You have a vase, you, you can have something for bread, like a corbeille. Like a basket, yeah. Yes, you have many, many things. And you have, traditionally, you have the um, wedding china, uh, but you can have the wedding china of her grandma, like oh, wow. a combination of heritage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, you can have to like uh, how today I choose this particular ensemble like collection because this is I don't know your birthday so it's one of the year and uh, I think this choice shows something about your host something about take care of you it's a big deal you know like mm -hmm. yeah but. The hospitality don't depend of the the number of pieces of the table. I think now the contemporary way is very simple, but uh, it could be very efficient and very powerful too, with maybe with the choice of pieces. Okay. Yeah, because that was sort of going to be my next question, because if it's your grandmother's wedding, your grandmother is serving her grandmother's wedding china, I mean, is that something that you think is ending and it's a generational difference? Like, would your friends have the same, you know, your contemporaries, would they have the same attention, but just a different style? Yes, I think the generation of my parents try to have less things. And I think it's come back, but in a different way. In the ceramic studio, we have like grandma coming to offer like, for example, plate sets, like nice plate sets for um, the first installation of her uh, girls. So I think it come back, but in, it's more simple. Like they take like four plates, but they take a particular intention of which plate, you know? Yeah, so not, you know, 12 plates and yes. three courses, but something really beautiful. Yes, and something that they want to keep, you know. So there is something for Art de la Table, like if somebody comes to your home, even if you don't know, it's like surprise, you have something powerful to receive your guest. You can have this particular intention to show them that you are happy to have them at home. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Paris, a state of mind, where real estate experts, Gail and Marie give you all the tips and tricks you need about renting and buying apartments in Paris and beyond. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Navigating the French. And I know that you have spent time studying and working in Denmark, and you have family in the United States. When you look at the way that people set the table in Denmark or the United States versus France, 
do you get the impression that French people pay more attention to those little details than, I mean, obviously we're overgeneralizing and that's hard, but have you noticed a difference? I think if it's the traditionally way, yes, but I think it's change and it really depends on family and the whole origin of the family. But I think the traditionally French meal is like, yes, big sort of art de la table, many pieces. But I think in Denmark, you have a particular intention that it's more a uh, touch by touch, like maybe a napkins or something. But no, it's because I, I never hit in grandparents in Denmark. Sure. <laughs> but I think because I saw many, many dishes like Royal Copenhagen dishes. So I know it's, it exists too. Mm -hmm. So in your work, when you're creating new pieces, and collections. Obviously, you know, you're creating things with heart, but this is also your job. So you have to create things that are going to sell. So when you are crafting new pieces and collections, are you thinking about the item as something that stands on its own or something that's part of a collection or something that's going to somehow interact with the food or the drink that it's used to serve? Sort of what's your approach? I always think about functions. I really want to have something not only aesthetic. I really want to have something efficient on the table. But uh, I like to have it in a style like in one of my collection. But each collection I propose, I work on something very simple, very... You, you can have only one item. And this item have to stand alone too. Mm -hmm. So it's part of collection, but you can only have one. I like the idea that my items will be married with your favorite pieces you already have, you know. You don't have to replace to get it. It's a part of our durable philosophy. I think you will have a crush with these pieces. This is handcraft, so... You have a price, you take it because you love it and it have to live with your home. You don't have to replace everything you have to get it. And that's maybe different from the sort of historic heritage way of approaching yes, dishes. Exactly. Okay. I think it depends on collection, but the goal was to have all collection and I think there is something to show how rich you are too. The more pieces you have, the more rich you are. Mm, okay. Yeah. It's like a status symbol in the past. Yes. Not now, but initially I think it, it was the, the deal. Like if you have, a, I don't know, like a four shape of plates for each meal it's, it's like i'm very rich <laughs> well i think the same was maybe true of wine glasses yes or the number of fork too <laughs> yep <laughs> so we both obviously as you said love food and the french approach to meals which is something that at termer we are working to sort of introduce to other people because i think in france more than in the united states and and less now than maybe 50 years ago, but still today, a lot of French people do still eat in courses. So you eat your entree, your appetizer, your main, your cheese, your dessert, and you take the time to linger over the meal. And over the course of the retreat, you lead so a 20-hour ceramics intensive workshop where people can really imagine and create their own collection of art de la table. So when you have people joining that workshop, what do you encourage them to sort of keep in mind when they're creating their collections? And how can their approach in the studio to creating their collection impact the way that the meal will sort of be carried out? I think it's dependent of people. 
obviously, that I think, well, you will uh, do some ceramic because you have 20 hours, we have time, but I think to beginning, it's like a design part. I share my skills in design. During this workshop, I encourage to take your time to think about your behaviors, what you have at home, what you like to eat, uh, what you like as decoration, uh, which attention you like when somebody receives you, what you like to cook, and maybe what you like to show of um, your recipe or something. I think I mostly encourage open-minded and creativity, but after it depends of each participant, we will work on you own collection like what you like and what you need we will try to to find objects you don't have at home or it's hard to find in the kitchen something will help you or yes something very specific for you and your behaviors Right, because the goal at the end of the day of Aldo la Table is to interact with what you're serving. So it would be very silly to make a couscousier if you never make couscous at home. Yes, that's a good example. Or oh, I don't know, you like to prepare this specific sauce of your grandma and this is a particular ceremony in the kitchen but uh, nobody see it maybe we can work on a set you can do it directly in the table and show and uh, yes share more things with your guests the way is to imagine that how experience continue at home take time to cook Prepare this moment with your table and sharing with your family or your friends. And it also invites conversation. So I, for example, in my house, have a Camille Drodz original, which is, I don't know that it's actually available to anybody else and nobody else can have mine. It is a really awesome carafe for wine. Oh, you have it? <laughs> of course I have it. My God. <laughs> So it's a porcelain carafe yes. that's hollow in the bottom and it's it's white. So it's not transparent and you fill it with wine and it sits on this wooden board. And the idea is you bring out your beautiful carafe that's already kind of got some mystery to it because it's white. So you don't know, oh, what's inside? Is it white wine? Is it red wine? Is it something else entirely? You don't know. And then you lift it up and underneath, is cheese. <laughs> okay, yes. Surprise. <laughs> so it's a cheese board. It's a surprise. And I love that piece because it's so playful and ludique and it invites everybody at the table to have a conversation around it, which is so fun. Yes, that's true. Which brings me to my next question, which is obviously the problem with having a podcast like this is that I tend to be forced to overgeneralize a lot. I d and I don't want to overgeneralize, but I will say that one thing I really love about French mealtimes as compared to American mealtimes a lot of the time is that in France, mealtime tends to be more convivial. People take the time to eat, and that is in large part because we have the time to eat. We usually have a longer lunch break. People are used to getting together on a Sunday and having a lunch that can last several hours, whereas in the United States, that's kind of rare. But I think there's a desire, no matter how much time you take in France, to sort of share and relate with the people around the table. And I think for a long time in American culture, that seemed to be something that was lost and something that people are definitely trying to get back. So as someone who's creating these pieces, can you think of ways that a specific piece or a set of pieces can encourage this sort of convivial environment around the table? Yes, there is too many examples, but <laughs> I think it, as I say at the beginning of how conversation, it's begin with this show, like if you see the table of the room, the room says like, look the time I took for you to make you comfortable to stay to my home. So 
with this organization of the table or something, you know you will take your time. But it's a show, but I think it's authentic intention too. You can feel it. That's why you know you, you have to take your time. And it's, you have the typically way, like the number of plates, maybe your host guide you like an experience in different parts of the meal. You know where you are do, during the meal, you know, if it's a first course or something. So that's a, the first way to, to know about the time you have to take your time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and after you have maybe the, the pieces, like shapes of pieces, some of them can encourage the conviviality too. For sharing food, for example, uh, I think about the fondue yeah <laughs> the meal <laughs> you have particular stool and dishes uh, where every person hits in the same plate it's like this is a concept of this meal yeah to hit in the same not plates but presentation dishes Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a really good example actually and it, it reminds me also of the machina raclette, the raclette. Yes, this is the same. Yeah. Heidi. Which I'm not sure uh, if if any American listeners have no idea what we're talking about. There is a tradition of so when you have it traditionally you have this like half a wheel of cheese on a machine that has this heating element and you push the cheese closer to the heat, or you push the element, I don't remember, and it heats the cheese, and then you can scrape the cheese off onto your plate. And the word in French for scrape is racler. So you're racling <laughs> melted cheese onto a pile of potatoes. It's delicious. But for home use, a lot of people have this other kind of contraption where everybody gets like a tiny little frying pan, and you put slices of cheese in the pan, and you put it under a heating element so you can recreate the same kind of convivial experience with that machine. So are there kind of ideas that you've created in your studio that make you think that people are going to interact with the piece in a different way or interact with each other in a different way around that piece? Yes, yeah, yes. It depends on pieces, but yes, I think the functional part can be a social skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any pieces like right now in your collection that you think people will interact with in sort of a new way that changes the way that they might think about the meal or the piece? Yes. I think I have a cheese board. It's something with a a cloche, a top. Yeah, like um, I think we say cloche in English. (laughs) I think it's the same word. Yeah. Yes. It's not changing something. It's a contemporary way of cheese board but um, I think the the shape is easy to uh, share a uh, fair passé and uh, as you said it it's encouraged to talk about and talk about cheese and um, share taste and experience and we both obviously love cheese so I'm happy to talk about cheese anytime <laughs> and uh, yes I work of um, I don't know the word, like casserole or a plat de cuisson. Oh, like a baking dish. Baking dish. Yeah. And I'm working in this idea of have the same dish for cooking and for presentation too. Mm -hmm. And that's always an interesting one because there's something really homey and convivial about serving someone right out of the dish like it feels like you're part of the family yes but you also want it to be beautiful yes that's the point if you're enjoying this episode of navigating the french you may also be interested in our sister podcast the heart of you where expert annette talks manifesting tarot and so much more navigating the french will be right back after a word from our sponsors and now back to navigating the french now, before you opened your studio, you did your studies in Limoges, which is known for having some of the best porcelain in the entire world. And it's got rich tradition and rich heritage. And when I think of 
Limoges. I think about a lot of the pieces that I find in like brocantes in flea markets in Paris, where you have these sort of old fashioned platters and they're quite dainty and delicate. And there's often like gold plating or like very specific designs on them. And I think that when a lot of Americans think of French de la table, they're thinking about that sort of type of pottery or that sort of type of serving ware. Have you seen in Limoges in particular, but also in France in general, an evolution away from that kind of classic style to something more contemporary? Or do you think that we're still manufacturing that sort of very traditional French porcelain? I think Limoges is very particular heritage. It's like something very institutional. Yeah. Like this is this particular white, white porcelain. I think this is very, I don't, this knowledge is very protected. You have an appellation like AOP for Conte or something. You have the appellation made in Limoges. Like it's, it's a big, big deal. And people love it like that. So I think it's hard to move this savoir-faire, but new generation of designer and artisan propose contemporary porcelain, but not like made in Limoges. It's like something they use porcelain. They use the traditional step of uh, making, but they take Ils font hyper attention. Mm, they're very careful. Yes, thanks. Of paying homage to this traditional savoir-faire. But this is for Limoges. I think the rest of France, it's move a little bit. Many manufacturers propose challenge, like concours, to move the line, you know, like to have new proposition and do something different because every manufacturer have a specialty like uh, in the north uh, you have manufacture for a square for the wall yes oh like tiles yes tiles thanks every part of france or every manufacturer have a specialty okay so and everybody want to move lines to have something new to propose but something use uh, them skills to stay different, I think. So what's like the specialty of say, like, Jian? Uh, Jian, it's like dishes, I think, but it's more the style. You, you have like a particular blue or something. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, cause it's interesting because you do see all of this very traditional dishware. And then, like you said, like there's a lot of movement towards more modern things. I recently was lucky enough to eat at a Michelin starred place here in Paris where they had a cave for the butter and it was very modern and very playful. And, and that's something that you wouldn't have expected to see on, you know, a high, a fine dining table before. Yes. And I think it's an interesting pieces because it's like RT pieces, but you have a function. You can keep the butter in like of dry area. Yeah. And one, one piece. Uh, or one sort of evolution as well that I've seen recently. And I think, yes, it will still be recent by the time this episode airs. We're recording in January. And January, of course, is the time for Galette des Rois, which is the sort of traditional cake that in France you eat on and around Epiphany, which is January 6th. Oh, you don't have it in America. No, we don't have it. We're so unlucky. <laughs> no roi mage in America. Okay. Well, we have Wamaj, we have the, the wise men, but we don't get cake. We just... <sighs> you don't have the bit. I know, I know. <laughs> and traditionally, you would have like a porcelain trinket, a porcelain fev inside. And uh, those used to be made in Limoges. And now there are, you know, independent designers making beautiful, unique fev. And I think you and your partner made some fev for local bakers. Yeah. Why do you think the local bakers wanted to work not with a big company to get fev that are shaped like Mickey Mouse or, you know, uh, puzzle pieces or the fevs that you find everywhere? They decided to go to local artisan to have a unique series. Why do you think that was important to them? 
I think this is the same way as the concept of art de la table, something uh, you want to do something at all, you know, like you propose a handmade galette with uh, quality and something, but when you have the surprise to have the fave, you are something industrial, I think there is something wrong, you know. They so want to have a completely handmade product and local. And uh, I think people, it's like a gift too. Like they're true something handmade. So for clients, it's like the surprise. You will have a tiny sculpture of an artist. It's um, something you can collect and keep and you can reuse it too. So it's a, it's a tiny, tiny masterpiece. <laughs> I love that. And I think that sort of brings us full circle to that the real point of Al de Table, because as you said very correctly, it used to be all about status. But really, at the end of the day, Al de Table is just about encouraging conviviality and conversation and, and sharing around the table. And that's what you do so well with your work. And that's also the experience that I think both of us are hoping to bring to anyone who decides to join us at the Termer retreat is just learning how to slow down a little bit, to exchange, to think about how, you know, beauty and utility can come together. And, you know, that's something that we're both really passionate about. So I just feel very lucky to, uh, to be bringing that to the world with you. Oh, yes, me too. So I think that's all the questions that I had for you, except for one, which is, Kemi, what is your favorite word in French? My favorite word? That's a good question. <laughs> I like the word papouté. Oh, that's a good one. Yes. Yeah. I like many words, but this one is like talk together, but talk together about funny things like it's it's a um, idea of spending good time together when you have the time to papote it's like no pressure no just nice time yeah to share almost like chit chat but like there's something very friendly in it it's a beautiful word <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to Papote with me today. <laughs> yeah, thank you for papoting with me today. So I really appreciate you coming on to chat. For those who are listening at home, I will drop links to the Ici L'Atelier website as well as to the Terremare retreat in the show notes. And why not? I'm also going to drop in a link to a story that. I wrote about the Gala des Rois tradition where you can see a little bit more about uh, Kemi and her partner Anthony's work on Fev. And we look forward to, to sharing all of that with you. So thank you so much, Kemi, for joining me. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And I uh, look forward to coming to your ears again soon. This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt. This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio.